Hello, this is Peter Adler. Uh, welcome to Hawaii After COVID, the first of a two-part discussion. Uh, this one and then one in May. Uh, I'm Peter Adler. I'm a mediator. I'm a facilitator. I'm a strategic planner. I've worked in the legal world and the business world. And I'm most pleased to introduce a couple of friends and colleagues, Bill Tam, who is a lawyer and a former deputy attorney general and the head of the Water Commission. He uh, is a lawyer by training and practice, but he's an economist by avocation. And I once asked him, how come he didn't become an economist? And he said, the law has better tools. So, Bill, welcome. Colin Moore, another good friend and colleague from the University of Hawaii. He's a well-known um, uh, political commentator. He's especially present during the election time. He's kind of like a golf color man. He's a professor of political science and director of the UH public policy uh, program there. And today what we're going to do is focus on economics and politics. And uh, a lot of questions running. You know, let's, let's assume we're past the COVID in another month, two months, three months, and then we're into the uh, economy and all the issues that attend that. So what happens when the medical crisis is passed and we are into that recovery? How bad will it be? Will it be a recession, a depression, a deflation? And what sits ahead for big business, for small business, and for the businesses other than tourism, like agriculture and defense and technology development? What does it mean for Hawaii's political leadership in that time uh, when we know that we are going to have to do some recovery? Is it going to be same-same? Is it going to be generate new political leadership, new energies. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, again, Colin, Bill, thanks so much for joining in this conversation. So let me start with Bill. Bill, what are you thinking about? What are you assuming uh, lies ahead once the medical uh, emergencies have passed? What sits ahead for us economically? Well, let me, let's frame this question a little bit. I don't want to get lost in numbers, but let's get a few numbers out there on the table just so we can understand this. The world economy is about $86 trillion. The U.S. economy is about $21 trillion. The global, US, global debt is about $253 trillion. That's 322 times the GDP of the world. The U.S. debt is around $19 trillion, and by comparison, China is only about $5 trillion. And the Hawaii GDP is on the order of 95, 97 billion. And um, our real per capita income is around 51,000 compared to about 50,000 for the U.S. mainland, but given the cost of living. Um, our workforce is about 660,000 people. Um, and so when you hear about 250 to 300,000 people filing unemployment claims, you're talking about a third of the workforce already without a job. So that's sort of the framework we're starting with. I think that one of the things that the state plans so far, uh, the House Committee and others have looked at, is how do you get back to where we were? We're not going to get back to where we were. Um, the, the future is not the past, and whatever you thought was normal is gone. Uh, I would encourage people to read some work by Adam Toos, who's an economist at Columbia, and wrote a really fine book called Crashed about the 2008 a financial crisis. And he's give, a give, give us a little synopsis. Give us a quick rundown on that. Well, the concept is that the assumptions we were working with, the econometric equations we use, are based upon a series of assumptions we've developed over the last 30 or 40 years, maybe in the last 30 years. But like, if you think about the state of Hawaii during the monarchy period, the republic period, the, the territorial period, then the state, We've had a series of laws and structures that were somewhat based on the past, and we modified them a little bit. And we're sort of still in the post-statehood world view that tourism, for example, is going to keep growing. We're up to 10 million tourists a year, and it's starting to tax our resources and our infrastructure. Our wastewater systems, our water systems. And the idea that that's going to keep growing is because it's useful for both the hotel industry and Hawaiian Airlines is not based on the reality of what's going on. For one thing, climate change is going to alter that a lot. Secondly, with regard to tourism, if you think about flying someplace right now, well, do you want to get on a plane and fly for 10, 5, 10 hours, 15 hours, sit next to a bunch of people you don't know, have no idea what you're breathing, even if they're all good, it only takes one out of that circumference of maybe 6 to 8 to 10 feet, 
breathing that air to give you a problem. So the wealthy people can afford to fly to Hana, fly to Kona. They can go to places that are remote and they don't see a lot of people. But the people who you need to travel a lot more, or who need to travel a lot more, are the people who can't afford it. They've just lost their 401k. They've just lost their job. The idea that they're suddenly going to decide to come to Hawaii now, whether it's from the mainland or from Asia, it's just not in the cards. So I think one of the things that will happen, for example, is that the upper end hotels will, will, they've got the capital of survive. Mid and lower level income hotels, they're not going to have the cash flow to hold on for two or three years. So I expect that those hotels will go through bankruptcy and distress sale, for example. One thing we might do is think about whether we should stand up a public entity, issue some bonds, buy those hotels at distress rates, because they're not going to hold, they're going to have to sell them to somebody. And Maybe, we, maybe a, a public entity picks up a bunch of those for 40 cents in the dollar, and there's the build infrastructure. You, you call up Peter Savio and some other people and say, hey, you know how to do this. Renovate these hotels so they're small apartments, keep them rental, don't allow speculation, and suddenly you start to solve some of the housing problem in the way that people who live here, including the homeless, as a separate set of issues, and you've now got build infrastructure at 40 cents in the dollar, and you've now started to change the dynamic of Hawaii. The second thing I think that deserves attention is we need to think in terms of our values first, and the economics then comes along to support the values, not the other way around. We've, we've been seduced by the financial world, and the financial world has a series of rules and concepts and actions which, first of all, are crashing about every 10 years now because they encourage behavior that may make sense if you're in a hedge fund, but don't make sense for the rest of us. So I think one of the things that we're going to have to do is rethink our financing based upon our values, and we have to look ahead. The last thing I'll say before we get on to other subjects is the effect of climate change on this is going to be dramatic. These are going to be a series of cascading events. Uh, recently, in fact, today, I think the CDC apparently lost funding to support uh, one of the labs in China where they had been taking other specimens because there are a whole lot of other things lined up behind the COVID-19. That's not the only virus out there. These are a series of problems that are going to attack our health care system, and so we're going to have to revise our health care system. We're going to have to revise our economics. And most critically, we're going to have to train people in new fields. Health is going to be huge. Education um, is going to be huge. Every, everyone's going to have to start to rethink how they educate themselves for the rest of their life, not just a one-time job. John. Bill, thanks for those first thoughts. Uh, quick question, and then I'm going to turn over to Colin and give us some speculations on what happens. Again, we're thinking beyond the immediate uh, medical crisis, and we're looking 18 months down the road. Uh, majority of people, we've either developed herd immunity or we have antibodies floating around now in our bodies. Uh, so we'll assume that. Let's just assume that. You know, it'll be prolonged. But at some point, the medical crisis passes, and then the economic crisis is in full force, and we have to confront it. Um, what, what's the function of all this mounting debt? I mean, the U.S. has a monstrous debt, and it's getting bigger. And most of the time, I remember some very famous Republicans who said nobody cares about debt. In, but that's not true. Debt has a big function. Tell us a little bit about debt, and uh, then I'll turn to Colin. Sure. Um, right now, the U.S. debt is 320 well, the world debt is 320 times the total GDP. The U.S. debt is a little over 106% of the GDP. As you know, states can't print money, so we have to every year come within our budget. In the short term, we cannot think about debt. I mean, debt is going to happen. We're going to spend what we have to do to get out of it. The longer term consequence is going to be we're going to become like our grandparents or our parents. Having gone through the Depression and World War II, we're going to discover that savings as a personal matter is going to be critical. And we're not, people don't want to have, you know, four weeks of savings and come across a situation like this. So we're going to start saving more, going into debt less, in fact, getting out of debt as fast as we can on a personal level. At a national level, 70% of our economy is services and consumption. That's going to have a cut against the growth of the economy. So we're going to have a prolonged period in which everyone's going to have to save more. Everyone's going to have to be smart about what they buy. Stop buying the stuff you don't need. I mean, if this isn't a wake-up call about what you really need and what you don't need, I'm not sure what is. So the debt issue is going to hang over the whole country. We're going to have to pay it off some way, and we're going to have to have some inflation to do that in nominal terms because that's the way you handle long-term debt. Now, what that means for the rest of our lives, 
I really, really have to think this through. I mean, people are going to have to educate themselves and start getting really smart about what they need, like our grandparents and parents did in the 30s. We'll just have to get more frugal. Colin, what is this? Uh, this is a tough economic challenge that uh, Bill's outlined for us, and we, we can talk about the degrees of uh, hurt and pain that are coming. But what's the political implication? Let's assume that it's going to be hard and serious. What's the political implications? I mean, it, it's going to be incredibly challenging for any elected officials to manage this. I mean, there's going to be national implications and. Um, you know, I, we'll see if, if Donald Trump can, can pull off an election victory. I'm, I'm skeptical that he can. But locally, I think, you know, there's really a couple of ways this could work. And I think right now I'm not terribly encouraged. I mean, right now the response, which has been confident um, from political leaders, um, still has kind of, uh, you know, you still see a lot of the, the infighting and, and grandstanding um, and, you know, kind of petty jealousies that you often see in local politics without more of a larger vision about how we're going to move forward. And I agree with uh, everything that Bill said. I mean, first, this isn't the time to focus on austerity or debt. I mean, this is, we'll take federal spending, we hope, and state spending to, to get out of this. Um, but in terms of in terms of politics, um, you know, I think that um, you know, I think you're going to see people's frustration with our political class build and reach a breaking point. Hawaii already wasn't in a good way before this. I mean, let's keep this in mind. Although we had a very low unemployment rate, and by me many measures the economy was prosperous, um, you saw our population declining, which was always a very curious statistic given you know the prosperity and how beautiful of a place it is to live. Um, a lot of working families, younger families, people who really would be the engines of the economy and of our society moving forward, uh, leaving this place to Portland and Las Vegas. I think you're likely to see that increase. I think we're going to see an overall decline in our population, particularly among younger families, um, because like Bill has talked about, tourism isn't going to come back for a long time, and it may never come back in the same way. Um, but, but politically, what I think is going to happen is... Um, the frustration you saw from nearly every public opinion poll out there, I mean, Governor Ige before this was one of the least popular governors in the entire country. Um, you know, the, the trust in our state government um, is by some measures lower than the trust in uh, the U.S. Congress, which is already incredibly low. Um, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the one-party state and the Democratic Party here in Hawaii from a lot of voters. Now, that may or may not be fair, but there's this perception, I think, that the government is not responsive or maybe it's only responsive to a large public sector unions. That's only going to grow, no matter what happens. Even if they find a great way to manage this crisis, there's going to be increasing pressure and anger and frustration um, uh, on the government. You haven't seen so much of that so far, a little bit of it. But I think there's a certain rally around the flag effect during crises like this where people are willing to give. Uh, their elected leaders the benefit of the doubt. As this moves into a long-term economic crisis, that's going to become that's going to start collapsing unless you get some very clear leadership and direction, uh, you know, around some of the policies that Bill talked about. That, and I'm not sure our political class is really capable of that right now. Um, Do you so think that Colin? Think that, go ahead. Sorry, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, no. I want to just ask you if you thought uh, there will be. A turnover in some of the generational leadership that goes on. We have a lot of millennials and others that are coming of age. That there's some that are poking their heads up and they're kind of interested. Uh, but we also know that uh, political leaders tend to want to grasp and retain power. Ones who've been around for a long time. Do you, do you see this economic crisis being a pivot point? It, it, potentially, it could. I mean, although I I've, I've thought we were going to see, um, you know, younger people take more leadership positions in the past, or uh, more more of the younger progressives w run and win office. Um, but I I actually am not optimistic that's going to happen. I mean, I think that would be a healthy thing to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen in the short term. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, really what tends to be kind of an incumbency racket. Um, you know, for them to circle the wagons, to protect the incumbents even more, um, and um, and for there to be even more pressure on people not to not to sort of upset the cart at this point uh, from the Democratic Party. 
Um, and so in the long term, maybe we'll see some shifts. But I, 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 I wish I could say something different, but I don't expect much dramatic change um, in the short term. What I do expect is increasing frustration. And for younger people, the very people who might challenge um, our existing leaders, for them to choose exit uh, rather than voice. In other words, for them just to simply leave Hawaii and go somewhere else. Question for both of you, then, that bridges uh, both of these discussions. Uh, it has to do with the unions and their influence. We know that we are a highly unionized state. We know that the unions exert tremendous influence and uh, pressure sometimes on any kind of changes. What happens to that algorithm? What happens? Do the unions simply just dig in and try to maintain the same thing? Will they be malleable? Will they change? And again, that could be very influential to the economics because there will be a fight to retain jobs and the unions will be at the forefront of that. Your thoughts? Um, Bill? Oh, okay. well, or, or Beth, you go ahead, Bill. Well, if there's somebody in the union movement, and I'm sure there are a few, who are shrewd about how they first started and what contracts they made as a social contract with everybody, they recognize they can't just stand there and keep doing the same thing over and over again. That doesn't work. I mean, I was in the state for a long time, and the vertical silos are very difficult to penetrate. We tried some other tactics, which I think could work, and if people would be shrewd about doing it, it could work, and that is start doing things horizontally. We kept meetings where we kept supervisors out. We got people of roughly the same level, so they weren't dealing with somebody who's going to criticize them. And we would organize task forces among departments, but horizontally. And people then could organize themselves and do things. I think the NGO sector is a great source of hope where people go out and just start doing things. And the government may be the last to come along. The unions have got to recognize there's a new social contract that has to be negotiated. And you can't just stand there and say, this person has a job if they didn't commit a felony for six months for the rest of their life. It doesn't work. I had to go through the process of firing people in the state, and it took me a year for each individual person. And that's absurd. I mean, there's no organization in the world that works on a basis that no one should ever be fired. It's just not, that's just not human nature. Now, there's some trade-offs you can make for it. Job training, for example, is one of them. If you think you're getting skills, you may accept the lower wage for a while, if you get skills that will allow you to do things. So it's got to be, there's got to be a trade-off here to make it nimble. But the nimbleness has got to come through leadership, and that's going to have to come with people who are prepared to make some changes. And that's so, key. So one of those tensions is going to be uh, the deossification, and because we know government is very siloed, uh, and unions are very influential in all those silos. And we're going to have to figure out how to get nimble, and the unions probably are going to need to bend on some of uh, what they would normally uh, assert during good times. Colin, unions, economics, well, the right. economic picture and political picture? So the unions are the most, arguably the most powerful political actors in the state, the public sector unions. Um, but I think they realize this, particularly after, you know, some of their authority after the Janus decision was eroded a little bit, um, which has made it easier for people to opt out of those unions. I think I entirely agree with what Bill's saying. The unions, if they want to survive, because there's going to be a lot of pressure on them, even more resentment than I think normal is normal from a lot of citizens of the state. They're going to ask, well, why should this privileged class of public employees protect their benefits, protect their salaries? Well, everyone else is suffering, and they're going to have to actually confront those questions. It's not going to be enough um, to just kind of stand on past contracts or past successes because I think the resentment level is going to increase. Now, what I think the unions could do um, is try to really embrace what Bill's talking about, trying to, to embrace new ways of structuring government and the deliver of public services, and to be able to say, look, the people in the union, these public sector workers, these are, you know, sort of the best and the brightest. You are getting tremendous value for your money. Um, we're the first to kind of police our own. Uh, we, um, you know, we are very open to rethinking about how government is structured, how policies and procedures work. Um, you know, if they can do that, I think they'll actually be able to protect some of their salaries and benefits, um, you know, which will be good for their members because, I mean, overall, I think unions are, are – a beneficial thing. Um, but I don't think they've been very nimble. They've actually been some of the least nimble um, 
groups in Hawaii. And you can see that with how slow our government has been to react. I mean, you know, mo anyone who's worked for a public agency here can talk about how you know, it will drive you to tears sometimes. Even people inside the agency are uh, trying to get things done. Um, it's just demoralizing. And I think the union should see themselves as a force for change um, and not just simply running some, some jobs protection uh, program. Just for those who may not remember it or know it, give us the one-sentence version of what Janice said, the Janice decision. So Jan in, in short, Janice says you can't run a closed shop. Um, in other words, you can opt out of being a member of the union, which you already could, um, but you don't have to pay any dues at all. Prior to Janice, you could opt out of a union, um, and you'd get a certain percentage of the dues refunded. Uh, now you can opt out, and you don't have to pay any dues into the union. And the union would argue that that's just creating free riders because those people are benefiting from the collective bargaining contracts. Good. Um, well, we've got a few minutes left, and I would like to ask you both, Alan Oshima, uh, who's a, a respected guy and comes out of the electric company and is a regulatory lawyer by training and very wise and smart in the ways of government and business and definitely the ways of Bishop Street. What advice would you each have for him if we, if he called, if he asked, um, what would we tell him? What would we say? You know, and he's got a plan. He's, you know, kind of phasing and staging. I'm not quite sure who he talks to, who's on his revitalization uh, group, his work group. But what, what, what's the advice we give him? What would we tell him? Oh, saying right now, you know, the medical crisis will pass through. It'll take 18 months, um, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. What, what, what advice might you offer him? Oh, go ahead. Well, the advice I'd offer him, and I'd offer this to the, you know, the rest of the EGA administration as well, um, you know, this plan that they've crafted isn't going to mean much if they can't sell it to the public. And I think that they have to figure out a strategy to communicate this, and the plan needs to look sort of visionary. Um, that they're, like they're not wasting this crisis, but it has to be a plan that people can buy into, that the legislators can buy into. Um, and I don't think the communication around much of this crisis has been very good. And, you know, there may be more technocratically oriented people who will say, well, that's not so important. But, but it is. It's essential if we're actually going to develop a coherent strategy that we're able to enact. Bill, thoughts? What, what advice? I'd say two things. I'd say one is you have to go out and meet with the community and hear them and have people in your committee that are respected leaders in that community. Talk to Kua, talk to Kuna, uh, uh, talk, talk to people who've been doing things in the community, in the Hawaiian community, and don't try to force things through without their input. And the second thing is you either grow or you pay more for remaining the same. So you're going to have to step outside of what's comfortable in your experience and what the people in Bishop Street, I understand all that, they can't just repeat the same pattern. They've got to find people who recognize, like Ariyoshi did actually in a lot of ways, that you've got to do something that is fundamental and deep in people's feelings and not simply rehashing the same stories over and over. You know, like you both, I've been watching uh, Governor Cuomo from New York in the mornings and contrasting him with our president, uh, and they're very different styles. And Cuomo is uh, quite interesting, and he brings reporters in who ask quality, smart questions, and they have a dialogue. He doesn't pretend to have all the answers. He brings a lot of facts on the table. Somehow, uh, we don't seem to have that at the moment, that kind of eloquence and spokesperson. And I, I don't say that uh, critically. I mean, Governor Ige is a fine man. He's a nice guy and very collaborative in his own ways. But we don't have a, a tough, iconic leader who is grounded in facts, which is, seems to be something that we quite need. And I don't know where that will emerge. Hopefully that comes up in the, in the next uh, year or so as, the, uh, you know, as we start to contemplate the, the change in economics. Well, we have just a couple minutes left. Thoughts? Peter, I'd like to suggest that people look at Franklin Roosevelt's 1944 State of the Union address in the last section he outlined in the middle of the war, mind you. This is 1944 before Normandy, a second Bill of Rights. And in that, he outlined things that he read pretty well today. And if you read those things, you realize in the height of World War II, before the invasion of Europe, 
uh, that he was willing to lay that out. And having come through the depression, I think people would be amazed at what he said. It was um, a remarkable act of leadership, and I think something like that has to be reframed today. And I would encourage people to look at that as a model. Well, this is a time when we, we really need that. I've just finished reading Doris Kearns' uh, wonderful book on leadership and the four presidents, crisis management and transformation, and uh, those, that interesting nexus that happens when the right leader – Reach the, meets the right moment, even though, however flawed they may be, there is something uh, that is uh, quite quite uh, above and beyond in those kinds of moments. Um, any other well, thoughts, Colin? Well, what they Roosevelt didn't flinch from telling people what the problem was. He yeah. was up front about it. It's like Churchill was. So yeah. don't, don't hide things. Don't hide stuff. Colin, I would, I would I would agree with I would agree with Bill and, and to follow the, the the New Deal example he's given. I'll say one of the biggest problems we're going to confront is long term unemployment, and there's nothing worse for people for their psychological health, for their physical health, than to be employed. I think we should look at some sort of Works Progress Administration for the state yeah. um, in the short term. I think that would be great. That's something we can do right away. Those were really great, great uh, deeds that they did, and some of those are lasting things in the national parks, on roads, on bridges, all kinds of things. But it will take that cooperation also with the unions to make that happen. That's exactly the new compact that needs to be forged. Um, gentlemen, well, get, thank you so much. Doors may be our best therapy. <laughs> um, Bill and Colin, thank you so much for Thanks, this uh, brief conversation. Uh, May 14th, Part two will take place. I'll have with me Don Chang, who is a lawyer and a social worker, but very much a, a, a thoughtful Native Hawaiian who looks at a lot of different pieces of what's going on. She'll talk to us about culture. And Celeste Connors from Green Growth and Aloha Plus Challenge will talk to us a little bit about sustainability and its connection to security. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And back over to Haley and Eric at ThinkTech. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Colin.